Hello beer tubers and welcome to a very special The Master of Hoppets on the Road. Look where I'm at. I'm at Driefontänen, Lambigodon, in the barrel house. And uh, David is kind enough to give us a tour of the facilities here. And we're starting off with a little sample of three-year-old Lambic straight from the barrel. This is really cool, right? It doesn't get more fresh than this. Or fresh. Well, it's aged beer. But it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, this... I don't think I've had like single lambic of just one age before like this, but this will eventually become Guza. And as it is right now, it's just drinking really nicely. It's mildly funky. It's really, really stone fruity. Like I'm getting loads of apricot and just like nice dry woody oak. So David's going to give us a tour. We're going to have a look at the facilities here. We're going to try some lambic. I think this will be a great, great time. I mean, just look at this place. Cheers. I'm David from Drifontana. Hi David. Hello. Hi. Uh, so this is the barrel room. We've been here uh, since 2016, um, where we slowly moved all the fooders that were on different locations before that to here. And actually since last year, uh, all the fooders and barrels are actually stocked here because we sometimes age lambic up to five years on barrels uh, and you can actually move uh, a lambic food or a barrel if it's full. So it took a couple of years, but now we have stocked it and there's still room uh, for other barrels, but we're going to stop it here. Uh, there's around uh, 8,000 hectoliters here of lambic stock. Uh, so average age is two and a half years. So if you, if you combine everything, uh, average age of the lambic is two and a half years because we have fooders that are four or five years old and younger, uh, younger barrels as well. Let's walk a bit. So the fooders are basically to age lambic for a longer time because it's a slower maturation process because you have a higher um, um, connection with the wood. Uh, this is uh, more specialty barrels and the smaller barrels. You have sherry barrels. This entire row are different type of sherry barrels ranging from Oloroso, Palo Cortado, uh, Moscatel barrels, Pedro Chimes barrels. Uh, How old are they? They look really old. <laughs> so most of these barrels, um, we can for sure say they're at least 40 years old because there's a rule wow. uh, as well that you have to use them uh, for at least 30 years. Uh, but most of these barrels that we know the history from and we have barrels 40, 50, we, we have one that's 70 years old. These barrels are being used for, for yeah, a long decades uh, because of the Solera process uh, as well. And we source them directly from the bodegas. So we drive up there, uh, select the barrels for quality. So there's no in-between barrel broker. So there's the bodega name on there as well. Oh yeah, sure. Um, and you have sometimes the name is on there, like PC means uh, Palo Cortado, which is one of the rarest cherry varieties. There's a couple of cherry varieties. Then you have uh, Olorosa Vieja. Um, and it's uh, sometimes the name of the bodega is on there as well. Um, you have the Fino barrels, the PX barrels. Oh, yeah. Uh, next to, and then our own barrel mark, the tree, which means it's Tree Fontana Lambic as well. Uh, on the other side, you have still one of the oldest barrels in stock. These are the Pilsen Urquell barrels uh, that we sourced actually the early 2000s uh, together with the Cam. Armand sourced this uh, when the Cam started back in the day uh, because Pilsen Urquell doesn't use uh, these barrels anymore. Uh, and these are barrels, if you maintain them well, they give very good lambic. They, we, we reference as, as almost like seasoned barrels if you put wort in them, they know what to do. They start fermenting immediately. Uh, a very good product comes from there. So you have the different barrel marks as well, which is quite interesting on these barrels. So you have the tree, uh, if you zoom in on the tree, that's for Tree Fontana, Brut Lambic. And then you have other barrel marks. So this is the Lindemann's barrel mark, for example. Uh, but we have used other ones as well. Actually, almost every barrel besides sherry barrels or any specialty barrel barrels, we just want the influence of the wood. Even like the large fooders in the other room, uh, the wine crystals are scraped away because we just want the pure influence of the wood 
and we just want a quality food or a barrel that goes for a couple of decades. This is a quite interesting experiment as well. So there's uh, some Flemish names written on these barrels. Uh, these are actually old heirloom varieties of cereals, of grains. Oh. Uh, we have been experimenting since yeah, the last five, six years with. Uh, and actually, since last year, brewing 100% of our own Lambic with like old varieties like Rosse van Limburg, the ripped head of Limburg, uh, Witte van Vlaanderen, the white of Flanders, which is the old names of uh, pre-war uh, grain varieties that basically all lambic brewers used but of course um, yeah, what happened um, then didn't use them anymore and like most brewers in the world uh, source their grain from the world market and at one moment we thought that was wrong and we set up our own network of local farmers uh, organic farmers that went back to old uh, going back to old grain, testing with old grain varieties. So they went to seed banks around the world, finding these old varieties, wow. which is quite hard, then uh, testing them out on a test field. And it takes a couple of years, then seeing what works, seeing what you can brew lambic with, seeing what the taste difference is, uh, stuff like that. So we're st it's still a continued process. Uh, we actually have one, Lucas, uh, who works with us full time, uh, who, uh, manages the entire network is doing a great job there as well um, there's some pictures here as well which is interesting of the brewing process which is pretty straightforward you're probably wondering why there are pictures here that's because when we moved to this location we moved almost everything uh, all the barrels the, the the labeling the bottling the fruit tanks all to here except one little thing the brewing installation, so the oh. cool ship and the brewing tanks. Why is that? It's the same building since 1953. We have been brewing there since 1998. And if we just moved it from that place, which is a couple of kilometers down uh, from here, it's up a hill in Beersel Centrum, uh, across from the church, uh, we kind of knew that this taste, we had a risk that the taste will change of the Lambic. And we didn't want to take that risk or we didn't want that. Uh, so we kept that uh, place there. Uh, also note the wood that is on the ceiling. Uh, you have a certain microclimate there as well. And there's a certain, probably certain microorganisms living there as well, because it's all natural yeast. Lambic is brewed, uh, completely spontaneous fermentation. Uh, we don't add any yeast at any process. We don't add anything uh, unnatural at any process. Uh, that's the reason uh, we stayed in that uh, and still brew uh, in the brewing season, which is long over now because we're in the summer um, in that place. So we only brew during the cold months, which normally is between November and April. It can go above 8 Celsius at night. Uh, why is that? Uh, we want the wort to actually cool down on the cool ship. The cool ship is the two oh, vessels yeah. on the right side. So after we brew, uh, the wort goes on the cool ship and it cools down the entire night. And in the morning, uh, when the wort is actually fermented by the natural yeast all around us, we put the windows open at night as well, so everything from the valley can come in. Um, and it just, natural yeast are all around us, on the wood, on your skin, on the ceiling as well. It naturally inoculates it. Uh, then the wort comes to here and then we fill the barrels. The actual brewing process is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have a very long boil. Uh, we boil for roughly four or five hours. Wow. Uh, which is, yeah, it's a very ancient process. We lose 35% of the liquid as well uh, at boiling. We use old hops. Some hops have been aged for 10, 20 years. Uh, only noble hops. We don't want any bitter hoppiness. We're not making an IPA here. No, no. Um, <laughs> So we have hop farmers that we've been working for decades who age our hop for us in pellets. Uh, and then, then it's where really the magic really happens when, that's a beautiful picture as well from Diego uh, standing next to when the cool ship gets filled, which actually should come back in the brewing season to see it. Um, the room 
is like a sauna almost and then we put the windows open and the air comes in and yeah then that's where really it happens uh, where the natural inoculation of the yeast the natural yeast uh, come in contact with the wort which is full of sugar and then you have yeast natural yeast and sugar yeah then you have alcohol and this is the way they've been making beers for centuries and we have not changed that process we have continued like the traditional line of the way Armand and Gaston has, have done it and uh, their predecessors as well. And we're actually going back more to uh, uh, old times, getting the fruit from local organic growers, getting heirloom varieties of fruit, like old varieties of fruit, not supermarket varieties. And the base product, the grain, getting uh, from land races. So races, uh, uh, um, types of cereals that grow that were growing here for centuries the region of Brabant even before Belgium even before uh, we as a country existed this was a, a grain growing region the Fayotteland and Brabant around us uh, so we're going back to that supporting local farmers as well uh, not getting stuff from the world market uh, which is quite important if you follow the news as well uh, for us it's important to know okay we have tasks one of our farmers, he's from a village in Pepinga. Uh, knowing what he goes to, knowing supporting him, actually paying him when he uh, 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 when he's um, seeding, when he's um, um, starting, uh, not at the end of the harvest. Um, so we are uh, we're working with the farmers and getting everything locally as possible. So this is the nocturna which is oh. not lambic, but it's actually our own recipe. Uh, it's still spontaneous fermentation. Um, it's actually based on an old Flanders red style recipe. It's our homage kind of to it, but still cool shipped, uh, still, um, yeah. Spontaneous, spontaneous fermentation. Uh, but wasn't still that beer style like that in the past? Yes, maybe. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It, it know, was. It was actually very reminiscent. But most beer styles in the past were very close to lambic as well. Everything was spontaneous fermentation. Everything was mildly or very lightly acidic. Everything was aged on wood. Everything was aged for a long time. Yeah, the long, the longest night is one of the experiments as well, where we boil for a long time. Um, this is the one with honey, flower honey. Oh, so yeah. bloomer means. Uh, flour. So uh, sometimes we had honey in the cool ship as well. So you have the warm uh, uh, wort cooling off and then we add honey in it and the honey just melts in the uh, the wort and goes into the blend and ages on the barrel as well. It ferments out obviously but it gives like the nice characteristics, the floweriness uh, because yeah when you get really natural honey you get like a lot of flowers, um, a lot of herbalness. Um, yeah. Now we have some cool barrels here. Uh, these are, maybe you can guess what these are. Put your nose in it. Oh, I'll just film it before I put my nose in, but look at this. Okay, let's see. Oh, that's Calvado, right? Or so? Calvado. It's so apple y. <laughs> yeah. It's sweeter than I expected. Yeah. So we've put bottles away for a long time as well. Uh, so we have some Zinnit from there aging. So most uh, batches, Magnum. if you have a specialty batch, you might know what this is. Yeah, I saw the release <laughs> online. Um, we have some older batches. Um, we always put a couple of percentages away uh, to age for a very long time and sometimes entire batches. Uh, that's the reason also because here in the Lambica Drone we have an entire cellar uh, and a menu uh, where you can drink stuff from 2004, 2008, 2016. It's the reason because we started a couple of years ago uh, putting more and more stuff away for extended aging. And extended aging we're talking a couple of decades. So wow. let's say you're here in 2040, I think for us. And we like the idea that you can drink something from 2020 or 2016 or 2025, which is then an amazing product. So if you, I will, I will, 
quiet and say nothing. <laughs> oh, what do we have here? Interesting. Oh. <laughs> what do we have here? We have something stashed away for a rainy day. Look at that. That is a... Can you take out a bottle maybe so you can see it better? No, I don't want to disturb Oh, okay. <laughs> it's uh... You, you had enough. Yeah. <laughs> Some very old, so that's batch one or two of Sen? That's batch one. Wow. There's something there as well. Oh, yeah, I see what that. I saw bottles of that inside. So is that. That is pension blend? Ah, okay. Pension blend. So Armand's final blend or? No. Uh, so pension blend was made as a surprise for Armand in 2016. Pension meaning retirement. Um, and it was actually blended by Michael. And Armand actually tasted the blend, and it was at a time, 2016, where Armand was retired or almost retired, and, and said to Michael, like, yeah, what are you bothering me with this blend? You, can, you are blending for, uh, since 2012 by yourself. You don't need to bother me with the blend, but I know, taste this blend. Yeah, this blend is good, very nice blend. Bottle it, so he tasted it. Uh, we bottled it, actually, on his birthday, 26 October. Funny story, uh, his face is on the bottle. We actually had to distract him because um, he came in on his birthday and we had it, the bottles on the bottling line uh, and we actually had to distract him. One of, uh, one of our colleagues was pregnant at the time and he distracted and she distracted Armand and said, can you go get something for me? And uh, Armand, Armand, yeah, Armand being a nice guy, also, yeah, yeah, I will go get something from the store because he couldn't see the bottling the bottles on the bottling line, because of course, the year later, when it bottle conditioned, the year later, we actually surprised them with the bottles, the pension blend, and it's, yeah, quite the uh, iconic blend. It's actually uh, made with four-year-old lambic as well, so it's a precursor to the platinum blend. Let's say. Ah, okay. So over here, we do the fruit maceration. I this is the only modern equipment you might see, although this is not very modern. No, no. <laughs> uh, so these are for us, which we're experimenting with. Uh, there's some, uh, there's a, a, press? a press, a fruit press as well, which is sometimes used for grapes or other fruits to press them. We have made a wine as well. Uh, for quince, it's very nice to press them. So fruit maceration is very straightforward, uh, but difficult as well. You take whole fruits, so no syrups, nothing uh, of that nature. Uh, whole fruit, pits and all, like an apricot. Uh, whole berries and then we put them either on a tank but most of the time and more and more uh, and half of the blends actually are put directly on a wooden fooder which is quite special and hard as well to clean uh, so we put cherries apricots old varieties grapes whole grapes fill them up put lambic on top of them and then just let them naturally ferment because new sugars are forming as well we use uh, mostly uh, organic local fruits. Why is that? Because on fruits, on the fruit skin, you actually have natural yeast forming as well. We give like an extra complexity in the beer, an extra fermentation. Um, with stone fruits and with cherries, which is, yeah, there's also a pit in there. And that pit is quite important as well. So we have a barrel here, I think. Um, oh yeah. The Schaarbeekse, yeah, that's the Schaarbeekse, uh, which has been aging for a while. So we put uh, a creek, usually is one year maceration on the fruit. Uh, and that's all that's left, actually, if you clean it out, is just, uh, yeah, the fruit lambic, of course, which is separate, the pulp, and then just the, the pits. And we're talking a lot of pits, because yeah. we use a lot of fruits. We have a very high fruit intensity. Uh, sometimes you use a one on one percentage where it's like 500 kilos of fruit, 500 liters of lambic. And then we back blend depending on the taste, sometimes pure. Sometimes when it tastes so good, you're like, yeah, let's not add anything to it. And this is basically also the, the job of the blender, tasting, controlling this barrel, seeing if there's nothing going wrong, seeing if the fruit has given up or the fruit can give more. And this is also the experience of the blender. So this is very special, as you just saw. We just got poured Shabiks a Creek straight from the barrel that's been on the cherries for two years. I mean, that's... Uh, and usually it's one year. Yeah, one year. 
on yet. So this is quite special, and we get to sit and sip on it now, which or stand and sip on it. It is very intense on the uh, uh, marzipan aromas, I think. Yeah, you should definitely try some. <laughs> this smells really good. Deep cherry aromas, but really heavy on marzipan, I think. Yeah. And vanilla. Oh. Yeah, big marzipan and vanilla. Almost like, like a uh, creme brulee-esque vanilla note because it's so intense. <laughs> it's really good. And it has that deep shot baked cherry flavor. It's really cool, man. Thanks for sharing some barrel pours, David. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty exceptional to do this. Mmm, delicious. So the Chabixe is probably one of your more famous, like, original rare cherry beers, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's our cherry beer. We're quite, yeah. I mean, there's one or two other producers using Chabixe on a regular basis, but I think we have been we're doing a lot with it. Also with the network of, uh, of the families handing out the trees, people bringing in the scarabix of cherries as well. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, for us it's the cherry to use. Yeah. The craft of the blender comes in as well to like select, okay, I have that barrel that's one year old, uh, that's tasting nice, might have a lot of sugar in it. I take that three year old, a lot of wood. Then I take a very balanced two year old lambic blend them all together, bottle it with nothing added, hope there's a natural carbonation happening after one year bottle conditioning, then hope it tastes nice, hope it's carbonated, hope it then after five, ten or a couple of decades uh, will age very nice and will continue to age. That's really the craft that you can't really learn and it's handed down from generation to generation. Uh, I, I forgot one thing I want to show you, actually, a very nice image, which basically says it all. This is um, carved on oh. the fooder. One of the last pictures and a very iconic picture for us. So you have Armand, our pater familias, uh, the one that taught us pretty much everything, and then his father Gaston. Gaston who taught Armand everything. Uh, them cheering, them having a pint, and it's basically, for me, the continuation of the tradition. Uh, and this is also the time when this picture was taken, 2003, I think, when Gaston said to Armand, you don't have to change everything, you're doing it well. Um, because Gaston came from an era the 1950s, 60s, where Lambic was popular, where Lambic, where everybody drank Lambic, where it was the common thing to drink, where there was no other beer to drink, basically, around the village, where well, the whole entire economy and the social structure around the village was Lambic, and this entire region was Lambic. The farmer, the, the malter, uh, the brewer, the blender, uh, the people who managed the barrels, um, the cafes, the restaurants, the inns, everything was surrounded with Lambic. And then coming to a period, the 1980s and 90s, where nobody cared about Lambic, uh, where basically all producers went out of business or got bought up by larger uh, companies. And then you have a couple of people, a handful, only two or three people, like Armand, the, you could call it like the last of the Mohicans, who really kept the tradition going and a tradition that's been older than Gaston that's been going on since, since a couple of centuries continuing that stubborn tradition and that's the reason why we're here right now that we can taste a traditional Lambic that we can taste traditional Goeuse like a traditional Creek because of a few people like Armand who said like no I will not uh, do this or this to my Lambic I will continue to uh, produce it in a, in a spontaneous way, in a traditional way. Every blend has a blend number, uh, and sometimes, um, and very rare, it's like one or two times a year, uh, when we taste the blends uh, with a couple of colleagues, and when the bottle is opened and it's poured in the glass, 
there's sometimes like a minute silence and like wow this is a very nice plant and it's, it's a goose yeah when when a goose is is, is opened uh, and then we decide yeah this has huge aging potential this is a special cuvee uh, and then we decide because a goose in our opinion will only get better after a couple of years we decide yeah put it away for three years and then release it as a vintage put a then put a different label on it and as well. So the so, first thing is actually how far does it pop? Oh. That's a good um, aging... Um, indicator. Indicator, thank you, as well. Because if you have a lot of force and carbonation behind your Lambic, it will go well. Woo! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> how many meters was that? Wow, that's quite far. Yeah, something like that. That's an indicator. So 2019 vintage goose there. This is the 2019 OGV that we just popped from the... Unreleased. Unreleased from the bottle cellar uh, and bottle conditioning room. And it smells really good right now. Do you, So when, when you know you want to release this, is that by just sampling bottles? Uh, yeah, the only thing... Um, with every blend, it's not coming to the market mm. if we don't like it. So every blend is being tasted, uh, bottle conditioned for a proper amount of time. So six months for fruits, one year for goose. Um, and with the vintage, it's three years, three year bottle conditioning. So aging on the bottle for three years. Um, and then if we like it, uh, we sell it. If mm -hmm. we don't like it, we age it a bit further. But that's it. That's a good way to do it. This That's is drinking very nicely. Yeah, it's nice. Very fruity. Really stone fruity. and all, But also lemony. Yeah. It's a typical uh, goose, I think. Mm -hmm. It is. It's nice after a couple of years. Yeah. it's it's You're starting to also really sense more of that oxidative character. It's not like big. No. Yeah, it's, it's not a super fresh one because it's now in its third year. It's bottled like early 2019. So it's... It's becoming more and more of an aged goose, which it's nice. Uh, and that's the that's a cool thing about goose as well. Uh, you can age it for yeah, decades. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you can store that. Like as it says on the bottles, with the best before dates. Yeah, I mean we have to put a date on it. Right yeah. now it's two thousand forty-two, but don't throw your bottles away in two thousand forty-two. No, 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 no. It's gonna be amazing <laughs> then, I think. I think so. So we have the bottling line ah. so everything is here so the bottling the, the labeling the, everything to make it so we're using champagne corks uh, with the vintage dates uh, printed on there oh that happens in this machine cool yeah it happens in the machine so it's uh, quite a nice uh, cork uh, it's put on champagne bottles and then you have the muselet which is this thing that indicates what it is. So this is a goose because it has a green muselet. And then the core comes in and that's it. In the Lambic Grove, we have a lot of like uh, older vintage bottles uh, on the menu. And if you order them on the menu, they come from here. So we have yeah, 14 oh, golden lens, um, some vintage bottles, uh, 2008. So we have 2004. Here, not a, long, not a lot left, the Magnum. Um, but then you also have like yeah, bottles on the menu that are more recent, like the 2020 Zenith Frontera Magnum, the one that's, uh, yeah. And then you have yeah, some other experiments. You have some older Scharbecks as well, uh, 2015. Yeah. Uzo 2009 is very nice. I think that's the next one you should drink. Nice. I mean, no. that's your decision, of course. <laughs> As a final part of the tour, David showed us around the grounds outside Lampicodrome, where they're growing various fruit trees like quince and scarabics and cherries and have beehives where they have bees where they can harvest honey for use in their lambics as part of some of the new blends they're doing, the honey blends and a lot of their fruit lambics, even working together with different local farmers to produce these specialty blends. I want to give a massive thanks to the team at Three Fontaine for their hospitality and a big thanks to David for showing us around the premises on his time off.
If you're coming to Brussels, visiting Driefontein and Lambic au Drôme is definitely a must, especially if you're a Lambic geek. So make sure to head on over next time you're in town. And as always, guys, remember to comment, subscribe, check out the Facebook fan page and Twitter and Instagram, and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And stay tuned for more fantastic videos from my vacation in Belgium this summer. And I'm going to say cheers and see you in the next one.